They were the first successful double act in the world of cinema. They were two of the few performers who survived the invention of the talkies by managing to adapt their act while many other comedians found themselves unemployed. And today, even though fewer people are watching their work, which is now over 70 years old, they are still famous worldwide. Bronson Pinchot and Gaylord Sartain. Wait. In 2012, a Three Stooges reboot with actors impersonating the long-since-dead trio was a critical plop. But the one shining nugget within that pile of manure was that the Three Stooges themselves looked, sounded, and behaved exactly like the original Mo, Larry, and Curly. Now, the only way you could give that same award to the Laurel and Hardy reboot for Love or Mummy is if you watch it while squinting through a crack in a brick wall. And yes, I know that more or less gives away my opinion about this film. So if you'd rather not listen to me moaning for the next 30 minutes, bugger off. The character of Stan Laurel is played by Bronson Pinchot. Sound familiar? Well, his hammy performance in Stephen King's The Languleers has made him about as internet famous as Dan Backslide. I'm going to Boston. You're scaring the little girl. Scaring the little girl?! What the hell do you know about time?! Yep, he's suitable to play a comedy legend. No! <laughs> Gaylord Sartain plays Oliver Hardy, and in addition to being a racist southern sheriff in Mississippi Burning, he was a recurring character in a few of the... Ugh, earnest movies. Before I begin, some of you viewers might be wondering how I intend to keep this review... fresh. It is, after all, my seventh one. Well, here's something new to keep your interest. Look! I'm in black and white. I have never done that on this show before. Ooh, this is going to be more exciting than someone accidentally spilling their glass of water on a political panel program. <laughs> in 1999, the peoples of the planet Earth had a dilemma, as two films revolving around Egyptian archaeology were released. I know which one I went to see. Toy Story 2. In days long ago, when the pharaohs walked, one stood above the rest, Utar. So Utar, no relation to Utar, yes, so is not. was a very naughty king in ancient Egypt, who was about to get married, which would somehow help him become super evil, but he died, and a serpent instructed his followers to eat all the forbidden fruit and place a spell on Utar's bandaged body that would make him arise in 3,000 years' time so that he could claim a bride and... Try to take over the world. Opening credits showing Egyptian-style wall paintings featuring Laurel and Hardy getting into wacky situations. I am intrigued as to what this film's cover of the Cuckoo song will sound like. Let's hear it. The makers of this film had two choices. Either include the iconic piece of music associated with the Lowell and Hardy franchise, or not. Really? What, could you not decide what type of modern spin to put on it? Listen, I would not have cared how it was done. Orchestral, choir, rap, dubstep, as long as it was in the film, and not the last two on my list. 
And don't fade now. I want to see what was grabbing their arses. Gee, Ollie, I wish you'd hurry up. We haven't paid the library for the last copies that we made. Mrs. Boyk, it was one of those women put on this earth to control the free spirit of men like me. Ollie, here she comes. Hi. Hey, what Hi. The <laughs> Toast to again. One. The very first reveal is a continuity error, as Ollie's face is already being squashed against the machine. Two. That is not how photocopiers work. Three. You didn't notice or realize it was them whilst you were looking right at them. But the fact you saw them from a distance and have a grudge against them is the sole purpose you stormed up the stairs. How hard are they to notice? Stop! Stop them! Now that our taste buds have been soured by that introduction to our main comedians, we meet our villain, Farouk Ben Abdullah. Abdullah! Abdullah! His right hand mole man and several henchmen. At the mere wave of my hand, the whole world will bow down before me. I assume there was poison in their glasses, as we never see the henchmen again. At a museum, Discount Rachel Wise, like all female archaeologists, is so dedicated to her work, she has not found time to start a relationship. So what are we waiting for, single men? There's over 50,000 museums in the world! Let's go! <laughs> well, everything's ready. All we need now is the mummy. F. Murray Abraham, what are you doing here? Seriously, get out while you still can. You know, if you work this hard on your social life, I might live to be a grandfather. I am warning you, my child. You'll become so desperate you'll start trying to mate with this stuffed leopard. I've seen it happen before. You of all people know what an exhibition like this could mean for us. Personally, I think we would have made much more money with those animated dinosaurs. Oh, topical. Next, we visit a fraternity lodge named the Sons of the Brotherhood of the Nile. Show us the Brotherhood of the Nile has been a sacred fraternity of ordinary, hard-working men. Ollie is boring his audience to death, and Stanley brings us to tears by feebly impersonating the real Stan Laurel shtick. A principle that this great nation was founded... Sorry, <laughs> Who are you? When the going gets... Will you spit that out? Well, in conclusion, gentlemen, I thank you. I just want to say that I have been your uh, reigning high poo bar now for six years. You know me, you love me, and you can't live without me. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So Kowalski gets re-elected, and oh, apparently the villains are here. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Let's have a big Brothers of the Nile salute for Farouk bin Abdullah. <laughs> Thank you, um, Brother Kowalski. Repeating the same joke three times within 60 seconds. I hope you are enjoying this, viewers, because it ain't getting any better. I would like to marinate my friend, Brother Oliver Hardy, to head up the escort service. <laughs> Stanley likes to chew a combination of duct tape and super glue. Welcome to the States. OMG, the mummy's coming alive. Be very careful. That sarcophagus is priceless. Or not. On second thoughts, that might have just been a sneeze. Dead things do that, right? There they are. The librarian has tracked down Lowell and Hardy because they did not pay for using the photocopier. And doesn't it make you feel good knowing about the amount of paper wasted on that scene? And this script? That's forward, and that's back. What are you doing? Look at this. Help, Help me! It's oh. Oh. 
one, why was the librarian charging straight at Ollie when she could clearly see he was spinning out of control? Two, how did she get spun out of control from a sunny day nowhere near the water to a cloudy day right in the water? Well, that is one way to break your best friend's kneecaps. Don't worry, that's just the little tease. Laurel and Hardy are as indestructible as Tom and Jerry. If anything happens to that sarcophagus, their lives will be worth less than yours. Yes, because you didn't send your henchmen to look after the sarcophagus. It is, of course, his fault if they break it. Here she comes, master. Just as prophesied. Really? The prophecy proclaimed 3,000 years ago said that the pharaoh's bride would be a ginger-haired middle-aged woman wearing a yellow coat? I'm Miss Leslie Covington. Did you say Miss? How can it be that such a lovely creature as yourself has not yet been snared in a trap of love? Oh, traps are for animals, Mr. Farouk. It is a figure of speech, you silly cow. <clears throat> Oh, hi, Dad. It is indeed an honor. Dum, dum, dum. I acquired it as a boy. I'm sure you did. The duo arrive at the museum, hauling the sarcophagus in on a children's float to add some real dignity to the occasion. Pull the lever! No, the man told me never, ever pull the lever, and so I'm not going to do it. Pull the lever, Stanley! <laughs> Turn out for you, dummy. As soon as he sees her, Ollie falls in love with Leslie. I'm gonna break your neck! You are Mr. Stanley Phineas Laurel. That's my maiden name. And this is my very good friend, Oliver Thaddeus Hardy. Phineas and Fatius. No. No. Well, enough of that scene, as we cut to Leslie staring at the mysterious sarcophagus, as if something was compelling her to reach out and open it. Don't do that! You scared me. What's wrong with you? Nothing, nothing. Just leave it for tomorrow. Isn't that Farouk a dream? Hmm. Something like that. More like a nightmare. <laughs> hand me my toothbrush, Stanley. Stanley, hand me my toothbrush. Now listen, Stanley. We go to this gala tonight. Because brushing your teeth without applying toothpaste first is the best way to keep your breath fresh. To be fair, he probably thought it was monkey brand black tooth powder. Do not embarrass me in front of Leslie. Well, I'm not going to be in front of Leslie. I'm going to be right next to her behind. By now, viewers, you will have noticed Bronson Pinchot's interpretation of the Stan Laurel character seems to be of someone who is constantly drunk. On the one hand, it offers an explanation into the psychology of the bumbling, empty-headed Laurel. On the other hand, it's a bloody insufferable performance to watch. What's this? Oh, can't a girl get dressed up once in a while? Yeah, certainly, but perhaps a little decorum. Daddy! Mm -hmm. Good gracious, girl, I can barely see your cleavage. Barely! Mm. She is going to walk past him. She's 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 going to... Told you. Good evening. And then I, 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 I What on I, earth is he doing now? And then I just get it and I, I bow in the brand manner. Well, we'll get you in one of those nice hot bubble baths and you'll feel just like one of those little pink nose puppies. <laughs> what? Look at my suit! We'll get some club soda and try and sort it out. 
<laughs> like she didn't even notice me. Everyone noticed you. Go guard the, the exhibit or something. Yes, entrust the two men who have repeatedly shown themselves to be incompetent fools to guard a room full of priceless artifacts. Well. What? What have you got there? Nothing. Turn around. I... I don't want to turn around. Do you want me to come round behind you? Well, according to Harry Enfield... Just a moment, please. What? Wow, did not see that coming. Oh, for God's sake, neither of them heard or saw that happen. Here we are informed that these two are the nephews of Laurel and Hardy. Why does this matter? You have given us two characters who behave, dress, and have the same names. Them being descendants doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Since Leslie did not relock the sarcophagus, which I guess was also part of the prophecy, Utar awakens a few hours later. Must have fancied another quick snooze. He has only been asleep for 26,295,000 hours. And life begins anew. Praise the mighty Utar. Save me from these abominations. Wait, come back here. I demand you savagely murder them. You idiots. What have you done? Those artifacts were priceless. I said, what have you done with my mummy? What, what would we do with your mummy? Since the overwhelming evidence that they destroyed the exhibition is not enough, Arabian Hans Mulman points out he heard Ollie say he wished Farouk was out of the way so he could be with Leslie. What does that have to do with them denying that they stole the mummy? Detective, I demand you arrest them. I would feel sorry that they have been wrongly accused of stealing the mummy if it were not for the fact they destroyed all the artifacts. Meanwhile, at Farouk's lair... <laughs> <laughs> really? That's the mummy. That's the mummy's mask. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> the mummy. <clears throat> the mummy found Farouk, thanks to I don't know, and the villain tells it to kill Oliver Hardy. The new Oliver Hardy, who at present is locked in a jail cell with Stan and a biker, who aside from the bandana, is a terrible Bandit Keith cosplayer. Didn't we see her beat Tuffy Mankins for the World Wrestling Championship last year? Why, we certainly did. Hey! That's my wife. Why does Stan have a photo of that man's wife? Must have taken a truckload of bananas to make those monkeys sit still for a picture. Them's my kids. Why does Stan have a photo of that man's children? Fortunately, providing by this point you don't want to see these two have their limbs ripped off, the biker is really a big softie. And this leads to one of Laurel and Hardy's laughing fits, which popped up in a few of their films. The mummy smashes its way through the police station, causing several stuntmen to earn their pay, and for a statement about America's gun laws. Trick or treat! <laughs> Your lawyer's here. Two genuinely funny moments, huzzah! This completely changes my opinion about this film. The biker escapes after being flung through a brick wall, and Lowell and Hardy's nephews ride off in a police car. Well, let me get this straight. Some guy in body armor all hopped up on something, bust Lowell and Hardy out of here? Must be part of a gang. 
No one mentioned to him that the assailant was wrapped in bandages and wearing an Egyptian headdress? What is it, Stanley? <laughs> Can't you see that I'm trying to control this high-powered police vehicle? <laughs> well, that took care of that. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> I can't tell when loud things are happening right next to me because Stan Laurel was my uncle. Stanley, you can come out now. This short sequence is very poorly done as the atmosphere created makes you think Stan has snapped and is about to tear off Ollie's head or something. I don't fucking know. F. Murray Abraham is trying to sort out the surviving artifacts when Leslie says cheerio as she has a date with Farouk. Can't you wear something less revealing? I can almost see your ankles. Almost. We came here to tell you that we didn't steal the mummy. So he tells the two twits that 30 years ago, he and his wife discovered the cursed tomb of Uttar. Just after the sarcophagus was opened, they were called out the room, leaving little Leslie, who reached out to touch the mummy, and was suddenly grabbed by it. I began a tug of war with the undead. His wife closed the elaborate coffin, but in doing so was bit by a cobra, killing her instantly. And despite having left the tomb, he saw a boy steal the mummy's hand, upon which was a ring. It was the most horrifying day of my life. Gentlemen. <laughs> Gentlemen. Um, okay, uh, that moment is either incredibly funny or incredibly awful. I mean it, I don't know what to feel about this gag, but I know what I feel about Abraham's story. One, Leslie apparently can't remember any of this, but look at her, she must be at least six years old. 2. Why did Utar grab Leslie? I thought he had to remain dead for 3,000 years. Back then it was 2,970. Has the story changed to he can come alive whenever the sarcophagus is opened? 3. If the mummy's hand was cut off, does that mean it can just grow another one? And bullets can't harm it, but wood can. Oh God. 4. Yay! In order to defeat the mummy, it must be put back in its sarcophagus, which has been enchanted to stay resealed. You know, I am willing to believe that a Serpent King's curse can bring the dead back to life again, but a magical casket? <laughs> Nonsense. You can count on us. You certainly can. Lieutenant, who's the bozo? <laughs> oh, just some clown. What?! Hang on, why are they both sleeping outside Farouk's house instead of warning Leslie of the danger she is in? Oh, it is so we can have a hilarious scene of Ollie choking on a pinecone. Why must this comedy film persist in trying to contain humour? Well, hey, that was fun. I've never played full contact serenades before. Let me do one. It sounds like Bambi. Did you see that, viewers? A trademark Oliver Hardy breaking the fourth wall moment. Nice of them to include one. 45 minutes in, and even though this is treated as if Leslie is going for her first date with Farouk, when we last saw her it was night, and now it is the afternoon. Also she is wearing different clothes. <laughs> I have never been to America, but I assume it does not take several hours to drive to the nearest restaurant. Once they are seated at a table, Farouk pours some powder into Leslie's glass of wine, and not a single person notices him do so. She already thinks that I'm a 
thief and a liar and a nincompoop. And you, you forgot idiot. Idiot. <laughs> This restaurant is built out of the finest cardboard. While Stan joins a group of dancers on stage, which of course they just accept, Ollie disguises himself as an Italian, J. Jonah Jameson, and an Italian again, to try and prevent Farouk drugging Leslie. If you want to be with me, you gotta have something. Stan gets off stage and drinks Leslie's drink, forgetting the conversation he and Ollie had about two minutes before. This film upgrades the character from an idiot to a retard. And since Pinchot has seemed to be intoxicated throughout this film, Stan's performance here barely changes. Okay, now, Mr. Hardy, go. Get out. Fourth time's the charm, and even though the same drink only made Stan dopey, er, a mere sip knocks Leslie out, just as the mummy strolls in. <laughs> I suppose now I must be the designated driver. I can't take you anywhere. The mummy's after us! The mummy slips on some oil and glides into the kitchen's cold store. Oh, We've nice. got to save Leslie. Have you put a little bit of salt around the rim? Laurel and Hardy's nephews return to the museum to collect the sarcophagus, but find Kowalski is there. I've been up all night because of you guys. <laughs> Thanks to Stan being ticklish and Pinchot's overacting, Kowalski gets... They are now faced with the problem of getting the sarcophagus down from the roof. Why did they take it up to the roof? They came in through the back door. One... Two, three, Stanley, Stanley, where are you? If you are imagining that the payoff for this gag will require some sort of special effects, such as Stanley being as flat as a pancake, or that his arms are now stretched all the way down to the ground, you put more effort in than the makers of this film. These jokes are worse than cancer. Not really. One of us has to get in there to hold it down. Why? Seriously, why? <laughs> By morning, they still haven't reached the restaurant, meaning they could run from it to the museum within a couple of hours, but to drive back takes all night. <laughs> Although nine years late for its audition in Home Alone, the tarantula does its best. That warms up. It really glides along quite nicely. How could he not hear or see that happen? Oh look, Leslie has escaped. Oh look, Leslie's been captured. This next scene, viewers, makes me ponder quite a bit. How does Ollie manage to get the sarcophagus upright? Why does no one at this clearly busy dock think to at least approach this gigantic, talking, moving, Egyptian-looking thing? Why does a high-speed forklift to drive straight into it? Is the driver as desperate for Ollie to shut his big fat gob as we are? And most important, how is it possible for there to be no splash when a sarcophagus plummets into the sea? I have come up with the answer. This film is goddamn terrible, and I hate it! I'm so glad you're alive. Say, Ollie, come over here, see? Woo -hoo, woo -hoo, woo. Now, now, just... See, see, just... Uh. No, I'm drowning in here! No, you're not. But you should be. Then the biker dude turns up riding a Harley Davidson boat. But when we last saw him, he was getting caught just after escaping. Was he locked up in the same cell before they bricked up the hole he made in the wall? Or did he manage to get away because all the officers were still unconscious? While Leslie is unconscious, sort of, she is dressed up like an Egyptian princess so that Uttar can marry her. And it is at this point I realise I have no idea what Farouk is getting out of this, besides helping a powerful evil become more powerful. 
Is that also part of the prophecy? Oh, who cares? What are Laurel and Hardy up to? What's wrong with you now? <laughs> I was crying at weddings. Violence against women is forbidden in our country. We are not in our country, Habib. Hello, Paul. That is why you are the master. Okay, now I want to see a sitcom starring these two. It's the Farouk and Abraham Moman series, uh, no, that's just stupid. The final tepid battle between Stan, Ollie, and Mummy Mia, you will have already seen a hundred times if you are a fan of Scooby-Doo, or even parodies of Scooby-Doo. I love how during some of these shots we can see Leslie is in the background, still knocked out on the sacrifice slab. Just one moment, please. Oh, how convenient! Careful, Ollie. That mask costs twenty pounds. I think we've got to save Leslie. Farouk decides it is time to summon the giant serpent so that it can marry Leslie. Wait a second. I thought the mummy, alias Utar, was supposed to get married so to unlock his super badness. See what happens when you start filming before you finish the script. No, not that! This! I always knew this film had a screw loose. Thanks to dumb luck, the mummy falls into the sarcophagus, relinquishing it of life, unless it needs to sneeze. Farouk starts coaxing a cobra to bite Leslie, so this would be a convenient time for her to wake up. Kiss this! Did... did she just abruptly kill the villain? <laughs> Go feminism? Till death do us part. Shut up, you silly old moon! F. Murray Abraham and Kowalski arrive. How did they find them? Did someone at the harbour act responsibly and call the police? Gentlemen, that was rare courage indeed. Fellas, I owe you a pretty big apology. Took a lot of guts. No, Courage the Cowardly Dog is courageous. These two are bloody cowards. At last, the Serpent King makes a poorly rendered appearance. Time to meet your destiny. Not again. Uta. Um, the thing is clearly a hologram. What is it going to do? Pixelate you? Time for Stan to put that running gag to some purpose. Hey, fuckers, I'm up here. See, uh, now that all's said and done, I thought maybe it's time that you and I tripped the light fantastic. <laughs> oh, Mr. Hardy, that's so thoughtful, but um, Daddy and I'll be returning the sarcophagus and uh, what's left of the relics back to Egypt, so... Um... Take the hint, Ollie. Just maybe she's not attracted to men who are 150 pounds overweight. Well, Stanley, what have you learned from all this? Well, you know what? I think it's a matter. You've got to develop a thick skin. And that way, when a wet duck falls on your back, it just... Let Let's just right end off. this the most pleasant way I can think of. Suicide! Here's another fine box of trouble you've got me stuck to! Well, I was only trying to talk to her after all we're going on a vacation together. <laughs> Oh, fuck off. <sighs> to summarize, Bronson Pinchot is relentlessly intolerable and obnoxious. Of all the Stan Laurel impersonations I've seen, he is definitely the worst. The famous head scratch is practically non-existent, as it seems the only aspect of Stanley he remembers is that he cries, so cry is what he does. A lot. My only criticism of Gaylard Sartain is a nitpick. Oliver Hardy was not only taller, but thinner by comparison, and a lot cuddlier looking. It looks like if you tried hugging Sartain, he'd eat your head, and your food. 
the other actors do a fair job, including Susan Danford, whom IMDb says was uncredited, but there she is, above F. Murray Abraham. The storyline about the mummy goes all over the place, and the Tutankhamun-type head just looks so damn goofy, which might have been intentional, but I don't want to give this film any more credit. Especially as, overall, the biggest crime this film commits is thus. It makes you question whether Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy were funny in the first place. In conclusion, I really don't like this film. At all. At all. K. Review over. <laughs>